Just a reminder, Chief, you're still under oath. If you could please display and publish Exhibit 219 again. All right, sir, uh, before the break, uh, we were discussing the de-escalation policy. I'd like to now ask uh, whether the actual de-escalation techniques are uh, embedded within the policy itself. And so I'm drawing your attention to, again, uh, Exhibit 219, which is MPD Policy 5-304. And uh, if you take a look at the section here that's been enlarged, de-escalation tactics include but are not limited to, if you would please just uh, summarize for the jury the different bullets that you see here. Uh, yes, some of the, the bullets here for uh, de-escalation tactics. Sir, uh, one moment. Oh. All right. Thank you. Uh, all right. Uh, please resume. Uh, yes, some of the uh, de-escalation tactics uh, that are noted here uh, include but are not limited to placing barriers between an uncooperative subject and an officer, uh, communication from a safe position intended to gain the subject's compliance using verbal persuasion, advisements or warnings, um, using verbal techniques to calm an agitated subject and promote rational decision making, uh, calling for additional resources to assist, including more officers, CIT officers and officers equipped with less lethal tools. And CIT officers are those who've uh, been through the crisis intervention training course, is that correct? That is correct. And are Minneapolis police officers then at the training center taught different techniques on how to implement this policy? That is correct. Have you personally attended the training? Yes, I have. Uh, did you find it useful? I have. And then you can remove that. We, we've talked a little bit then about uh, behavioral <coughs> crises and identifying behavioral crises. Uh, how does the Minneapolis Police Department respond to persons in a behavioral crisis? Um, one of the first important things is uh, obviously is trying to get as much information prior to the call as possible. Um, but as soon as uh, officers at least have knowledge that this could be a potential situation with that caller, um, uh, this de-escalation piece should kick in. Mm -hmm. And, and that they, um, while they may not know exactly what they're going to encounter when they uh, arrive on the scene, um, this body of knowledge that they've been taught uh, should at least be kind of forefront in terms of the different tools that they'll be uses, using possibly uh, to help de-escalate that situation. Uh, what is an EDP, what is that acronym? Uh, the acronym EDP um, is labeled through our Minneapolis Emergency Communications Center as a emotional, emotionally disturbed person. And so when our Minneapolis police officers receive a EDP call, uh, that is prompting them that there's at least initial information that they're going to be responding to someone who may be in crisis. And that's something that the officer would then be communicated uh, by a dispatcher prior to going to the scene, correct? That is correct. Uh, however, when they are, if, if that information is not imparted upon them, they make their own assessment at the scene as to whether the person could potentially be an EDP. Is that correct? That is correct. It, you indicated that uh, the Minneapolis Police Department receives uh, over 100,000 calls a year, calls for service. Is that right? Yes. Do you have an idea of how many calls for service involve people uh, in crisis? Um, I believe in 2019, Minneapolis police officers responded to uh, about 4,500 uh, of those signified as EDP calls. Yes. Now, in terms of teaching officers how to recognize uh, a person who may potentially be in crisis and therefore unable to comply with commands, uh, you uh, place these different uh, signs into MPD policy. That is correct. And I'd like to direct your attention now to Exhibit 231 and ask that to be published. And this is 7-809, uh, the Crisis Intervention 
policy, you see it begins here, oops, sorry, but we'll uh, go ahead and over to page two. And uh, I'd like to highlight, please, for the jury, the definition of a crisis. And again, uh, in the definition of a crisis under the uh, MPD policy, uh, generally speaking, uh, we're talking about some of the same things that we saw before in the de-escalation policy. Is that right? That is correct. Um, there can be uh, uh, mental illness. Is that right? Yes. And substance abuse uh, can be a, a crisis or a barrier to communication, correct? Yes. And, and same with uh, various stressors, is that right? Yes. And then further, if you can uh, emphasize the crisis intervention definition. And officers, when they uh, either respond to an EDP call or are aware that the person may be in crisis, can attempt a crisis intervention uh, method. Is that correct? Yes. And generally speaking, what is uh, the officer supposed to do to a person in crisis? Uh, it's an attempt to de-escalate that, that situation. And the policy then of the Minneapolis Police Department in handling persons in crisis, if we could look at section three of the policy, would be the next page. Highlight Roman three. Okay, in accordance uh, with the Minneapolis Police Departmental policy, what, what are officers supposed to do? How are they supposed to handle encounters with individuals who are experiencing a crisis? Um, we really want to, again, we want to meet people where they are, we want to bring our values um, and our principles to those situations. Um, we recognize that oftentimes people who are experiencing crisis, it is not something that they brought on themselves, but they're dealing with. And so there's a sense of dignity and respect that we should be honoring when we come to those calls. And so, uh, as it's mentioned here, uh, the values of, of protection, safety, and sanctity of life uh, oftentimes, again, we are that first face of government that they're going to see. Uh, that may be 3 o'clock in the morning. And so um, we have to wear many hats, but we, we want to be respectful in that care that we're trying to provide for that individual. And, and sometimes uh, persons might be experiencing some sort of a breakdown that you know maybe they did partially bring upon themselves. Is that right? That is correct. And th are those people still entitled to be treated in accordance with MPD policy? Yes, they are. And this, uh, this policy, again, is imparted in training at the training center uh, by that group. Is that right? That is correct. Now, I'd like to, if you could take that down, please, uh, talk to you uh, a little bit about uh, officers' role as first responders in terms of providing basic uh, medical care, all right? And so uh, with that, can you uh, tell the jury, are Minneapolis police officers trained to provide basic medical care? Yes, we are. Hey, can we you are. please describe what what level, I'm aware there are various different levels of medical care that someone could be um, trained in. So most of uh, department members will have at least a basic training in terms of uh, first responder, the ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation, um, uh, the effects of um, um, applying direct pressure on wounds to stop bleeding, uh, many of the things um, that we will respond to perhaps just because we're closer to a call than perhaps our EMS or our fire before they get there. And they obviously have a higher degree level of training. But um, the training that we have and that we receive, it's very vital because those seconds are vital. Uh, our officers carry tourniquets. Uh, we respond to situations where members in our community uh, will have gunshot wounds. And um, matter of fact, a couple of my officers a couple of weeks ago saved a young man who was shot in the femur and was bleeding profusely, but because they got there quickly, knew how to apply that tourniquet. Those are some of the basics, direct, baby not breathing calls. 
our officers have saved the lives of, of children uh, who've choked or what have you because they've applied or they've been able to help start uh, emergency breathing for them. So those are, those are some of the basic types of first aid uh, that are uh, chest compressions, uh, those types of uh, basic first aid. And are officers then, uh, you know, specifically trained at the training center to provide this basic sort of uh, first aid? That is correct. And do, is the, does the Minneapolis Police Department have a policy uh, regarding any duty that an officer would have to apply that training to a real life situation? Yes. Um, we, we recognize, again, I mentioned that we are oftentimes going to be the first ones to respond to someone who needs medical uh, attention. And, uh, and so we absolutely have a, a duty uh, to render that aid. And that, of course, is in the policy and procedure manual, is that right? Yes. If I can display Exhibit 230, which is uh, MPD Policy 7-350, Emergency Medical Response. And, and under Roman 1, you see that the purpose of the policy is to uh, lay out in writing the roles and responsibilities of Minneapolis Police Department employees in incidents involving a medical emergency. Is that right? Yes. If we uh, could take a look at the policy itself self under uh, Roman 2, does that uh, explain what a Minneapolis police officer is supposed to do when they come upon a medical emergency or a medical emergency develops on a call? Yes. Right. What are they supposed to do? Um, one, while awaiting EMS, MPD employees assisting an individual having an acute medical crisis shall provide any necessary first aid consistent with our MPD training as soon as practical. And so then that presumes, of course, they're waiting for EMS or waiting for some kind of emergency services, is that right? That is correct. So would it be fair to say that this policy then is in two parts? The officer has to request EMS or an ambulance, correct? Yes. And while waiting for the ambulance, they have to provide, they're required to provide, what uh, medical training and skills they have to attempt to save the person. That is correct. Uh, are Minneapolis police officers provided uh, naloxone or Narcan kits? Yes, we, we are. What are those? Um, it, is, it is basically an inhaler uh, for community members who we may uh, respond to have overdosed. Um, it is to, if they've overdosed and are out, it is to give them that uh, inhaler uh, injection so that they um, can hopefully come to. And so we've, uh, it was a few years ago where uh, for the most part our Minneapolis Fire Department were the ones that responded to overdose and carried uh, the Narcan. Uh, unfortunately in our cities, cities across the country saw an uptick in uh, heroin and opioid overdoses we had to make sure that we were, again, because we were oftentimes the first ones to come across these situations, we wanted to make sure that we were in service to our communities and making sure that we, if we could save lives, that we were equipping our folks with Narcan. And a policy developed as a result of this, is that right? That is correct. If I can show you uh, Exhibit 229, it's published at. Is this the, the Narcan policy 7-348? That is correct, yes. And our officers, um, provided training in the administration of Narcan? Yes. Under appropriate circumstances? Yes. Okay. And uh, now I'd like to talk to you a little bit about um, the use of force. Does uh, Minneapolis have a written policy governing a proper and authorized use of force? Yes, we do. Okay. And is this generally covered in the 5-300 uh, series of the Policy and Procedure Manual? Yes, it is. I'd like to discuss uh, some of that manual with you and the policy with you uh, at this time. If we could pull and display Exhibit 216. Under the purpose of the policy, which is 5-301, uh, can you please read the first uh, sentence under uh, subparagraph A? Yes, sanctity of life and the protection of the public shall be the cornerstones of the MPD's use of force policy. What does that mean? Of all the things that we do as peace officers uh, for the Minneapolis Police Department, 
Um, and I mentioned the thousands of calls that our men and women respond to. Uh, it is my firm belief that the one singular incident we will be judged forever on will be our use of force. And so while it is absolutely imperative that our officers go home at the end of their shift, we want to make sure and ensure that our community members go home too. And so sanctity of life is absolutely vital that that is the pillar for our use of force. Uh, has this generally always been the case with Minneapolis use of force policy? It is not. When did that change? Um, we implemented this particular uh, in 2016. Has the training and use of force and application of use of force policy been imparted, uh, including this philosophy, onto police officers in training at the training center? It certainly has, yes. Does the policy itself define force? What is force? Uh, yes, it does. If we can take a look at Exhibit um, 217, I'll publish that. If you'd highlight use of force. Generally speaking, what is force? Um, it can be your, uh, any physical contact. It can uh, be with a weapon. It could be with a vehicle. Uh, but it's any sort of physical contact that is more likely to render harm or injury uh, to someone. Uh, is a restraint, is the use of restraint considered force? That would be considered force. And what type of force is authorized under a departmental policy? Um, we, uh, under 609, the, um, we operate under the use of force, the Graham v. Connor statute, objectively reasonable force. And if I could display Exhibit 217. Uh, first, uh, go back uh, to 5-303. 5-303 authorizes force, is that right? And you mentioned 60906, state statute authorizing force under certain circumstances, is that right? Yes. And uh, the phrase that's used uh, for the authorization of force is what type of force? Reasonable. And that force can be authorized under certain circumstances, is that right? Yes. All right, so now if you would uh, uh, go to the next page, and let's talk about the circumstances under which a police officer is authorized properly uh, to use force. If you highlight that. What are the circumstances under which an, authorized, an officer is authorized to use force? Uh, an officer is authorized to use force uh, affecting a lawful arrest, uh, executing a legal process, uh, enforcing an order of the court, and any other duties imposed uh, upon that officer. And that term reasonable force is further delineated in the policy, is that right? Yes. If we take a look at uh, Exhibit 217, I believe under the definition, objectively reasonable force. Could you please read that definition? Yes, uh, the amount and type of force that would be considered rational and logical to an objective officer on the scene, uh, supported by facts and circumstances known to an officer at the time the force was used. Oh, you discussed a, a case, the, the Connor, right? The Connor factors, yes. and I'd like you to, um, uh, well, first of all, does the policy reference the Connor factors that you just mentioned? Yes. If you could uh, display 217, page 2. Okay. And we have uh, three bullet points here under the Connor factors. And that is uh, the officer is supposed to look at the, the totality of the circumstances, right? Yes. And the three bullets uh, here that the officer is supposed to uh, consider are what? Uh, the officer should consider the severity of the crime at issue whether the suspect poses an immediate threat to the safety of the officers or others, and whether he is actively resisting arrest or attempting to evade arrest by flight. And uh, fair to say these, uh, these three different considerations are things that you can attribute to the subject, correct? 
Yes. That's the subject's conduct, not someone else's. Yes. Yeah. And of course, it has to be judged uh, by a reasonable police officer on the scene at the time, correct? Yes. Now, do you recall, uh, and obviously you're here talking about uh, what happened on May 25, 2020, uh, involving George Floyd. Do you recall why the officers were responding to Cup Foods on that day, the original reason for the call? Uh, the, the original reason for the call was a response regarding um, a counterfeit uh, uh, situation at the store at the intersection of 38th and Chicago. And in terms of uh, you know the deployment of your resources at the Minneapolis Police Department and as chief, uh, how do you rate, I guess, the severity of that offense, the seriousness of that offense? Uh, it would probably not rise to the level of, um, and particularly in light of uh, uh, last year, the level of violent crime that we've experienced in the city, but it, uh, um, we would certainly respond to it, but it would not rise to the level in terms of uh, severity of, of the crime here. Um, in, in looking at the, the particular type of crime, is that one for which uh, a suspect is typically taken into a custodial arrest? Typically not. And why is that? Um, if, if it's not a violent felon, felony, um, we also, in uh, coordination with our, our, our jail system and our courts, um, We've, there's been a shift over the years to make sure that the individuals who are going to jail are those who, uh, from a public safety standpoint, um, need to be at least in that facility in the Hennepin County Jail. Uh, and if we can I, properly identify and, and it's not a violent situation, um, um, you know, we can always charge via complaint and other things. And so, um, so that's one of the reasons why. You use the, 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 the phrase, I guess, violent felony. What's the, what's the more important part, whether it's violent or whether it's a felony? Well, violence. Why is that? Well, it can certainly uh, endanger not only the officers, but the community. Where something that's merely labeled a felony may or may not uh, require a full custodial arrest. That is correct. And are uh, Minneapolis police officers trained in the use of force? Yes. And, uh, pre-service in the academy and uh, also in uh, post-service at uh, um, the in-service training. Yes. And are officers taught the standard that force must be reasonable at the time it is applied? Yes. The entire time it's applied? Yes. Are officers taught uh, the need to assess and reassess and reevaluate situations uh, in the field? Yes, we are. Are you familiar with Minneapolis Police Department's uh, uh, critical thinking model? Yes. How are you familiar with that? Um, it was something that I wanted to embark and uh, make sure that it was part of our training curriculum that also includes um, the aspects of procedural justice and uh, procedural justice is really it's, it's actually research and evidence-based um, learning that has shown that if police departments um, treat people with respect give them voice um, establish neutral engagements and um, build areas of trust it um, our communities are more likely to cooperate with us we are likely to be seen more as legitimate. Uh, it has actually shown that our employees are uh, come to work, their wellness is better. And so, um, so this is very important uh, work. And so it's, it's part of that procedural justice I just mentioned is part of that critical thinking in our training. At this time, I'd ask to display only to the witness exhibit uh, for identification 276. Sir, do you recognize uh, Exhibit 276 as being uh, MPD's critical decision-making model? Yes. Uh, offer Exhibit 276. Any objection? No objection. 276 is received. Permission to publish. Yeah. So we, we heard about the model. Now we get to actually see it. And if you could enlarge the, the graphic, please. All right, so this is what the model looks like. It's sort of a wheel. Is that right? 
Yes. And the first uh, stage of the critical thinking model, decision-making model, is information gathering. Yes. Explain that, please. Uh, it's, it's very vital. Um, we rely upon um, trying to gather as much information as possible so that we can um, try our best to effectively um, go in, respond, and, and manage that situation. Um, trying to gather as much information at the onset is very important, but we also need to make sure that we're continuing to uh, try to gather as much information as we're, we're dealing with the, uh, uh, the scene or the call. I see the arrow points in two directions, and one it points to the middle of the circle, voice, neutrality, respect, and trust, and the other arrow points to the threat or risk assessment. Um, let's talk about uh, the middle of the circle first. Right? W what is uh, that middle circle supposed to be representing? Well, that's, that's the principles, really, of what continues to guide us. So, for example, information gathering, while we may associate it specifically with uh, receiving a 911 call and the dispatcher uh, giving us information, but um, information gathering could be that officers come across a call that they weren't dispatched to and they need to talk to a community member. If they don't treat that community member with respect or give them voice, it's likely that uh, they will receive less information that will be less helpful in them resolving that call. So that voice, neutrality, respect, and trust, that has to guide and be a part of all of that critical um, decision-making model. So let's go to the next step. The officers gathered some initial information, and now uh, the officer is a position to need to think about it or assess it. Is that right? Yes. And so the next uh, step is a threat or risk assessment. Um, is there a difference between a threat and a risk? Um, there, there can be in terms of in terms of um, what is being played out at, at the time, um, and you're you're constantly evaluating that. And of course, the information that you're receiving, uh, which may be fluid, is is going to dictate that threat or risk. Yes. And so then, once the officer has made an assessment of a threat or a risk, um, the next step, authority to act. What does that mean? Um, that may mean the officer now, based upon that the information that they've received, uh, evaluating that threat or risk, um, am I going to act? Is this going to be a, a physical arrest? Um, am I going to separate parties? Um, am I going to, does this require report? All of these things. So, um, but it's, it's giving more information for the officer to guide he or she in terms of what is the next appropriate step they, they need to act and take. And so if we were to, at least to, to this point in the, in the model, put a scenario into action, information gathering, the officer perceives that someone is um, approaching them uh, with a weapon, like a, like a bat, right? And so then they would reflect on that and determine whether or not the, this is a, a risk, it's a, it's a bat, maybe the person is at a baseball game, or a threat, the bat is being brandished, correct? Yes. Then after that, under authority to act, if they've determined that this in fact is a risk uh, and that they're being threatened, they would look at the authority back to the MPD policy and procedure manual. Is that right? Yes. Under what is the use of force policy? What tools are available to me to respond here? Yes. Okay. Um, the next step then after uh, considering the authority to act, uh, goals and actions. What is that? Uh, the, the goals. Uh, the officer is making an assessment. So with the Authority Act, will an arrest resolve this situation? Will separating the two parties be enough? Mm -hmm. um, um, is, is taking a report, will, will that be enough of a goal or an action? Um, uh, it may mean a combination of things. It may mean that I'm going to have to, or the officers are going to have to make an arrest, but we may need additional resources here because the situation is still could have the potential to not be stabilized. And so uh, so all of that is part of that goals and action. And then uh, to review and reassess, uh, assuming that means exactly what it says. Exactly, yes. And it, uh, information is going to flow, dynamics can change. And so it can be a constant just review and assess, reassess the situation to make sure that we're trying to get to uh, the best 
possible outcome in this peacefully and safely. Because circumstances can change, the situation can change, correct? Yes. And force that might be appropriate at one moment might not be appropriate at a different moment, uh, or more fight force might be needed at, a, at yet another point. Is that right? Yes. This uh, particular critical thinking model, Exhibit uh, 276, uh, we see examples of this throughout training materials uh, that are provided by the trainers at the facility. Is that right? Yes. And why is that? Uh, it's to, to really embed that knowledge that, um, you know, we don't want to fall susceptible to kind of check the box training. This, this training is important for all of our officers uh, to have a knowledge and understanding of um, and that our community members can expect this to be consistent as, as they have encounters or engagements with our officers. All right. Um, if we could take that down, please. And I want to shift a little bit to talk about, um, we've talked about use of force and the policy. Does Minneapolis uh, Police Department train its officers in specific defensive tactics? Yes. And where does that training occur? Uh, that training occurs at our Special Operations Center. And does the department provide uh, training for officers in handling uncooperative uh, individuals? Yes. Uh, does the department tr uh, provide training for um, handcuffing uh, reluctant suspects? Yes. And when you provide the training, you're assuming you're taking someone into custody, do you also teach officers their responsibilities, um, their personal responsibility with respect to the person they've just taken into custody? Yes, we do. And, and what responsibility does an officer have to a person they've taken into custody or restrained? So the, the American policing profession which I believe is the best in the world. And I will tell you why, and it's really two reasons. I'll rephrase your question. Yes, Your Honor. Um, sir, you have a responsibility, I guess, uh, and that's imparted throughout officers in various forms of training as to what, uh, once someone is in their custody. Oh, yes. Yeah. We, we, have, we have a duty of care. Mm -hmm. And so when someone is in our custody, um, regardless if they're a suspect, uh, we have a obligation to make sure that we provide for their care. Does that include um, people to whom uh, uh, defensive tactics are being applied? Yes. Why is that? Um, they are still in our, um, they're still in our custody and um, they have rights. And um, the humanity of this profession, we need to make sure that we're taking care of them. So how often are officers required to participate in defensive tactics training? Uh, it's usually yearly annual training. Uh, do you know that, you know, when we're talking about the training and policies in effect uh, on May 25, 2020, were neck restraints and chokeholds taught and authorized by uh, MPD policy at the time. At that time, yes. And they were taught pursuant to the uh, defensive tactics training as well? Yes. Uh, at this time, I'd like to uh, publish Exhibit 224. Exhibit 224 uh, uh, showing MPD policy 5-311 use of restraints uh, neck restraints and chokeholds. You see a chokehold is considered a deadly force option, is that right? Yes. Okay. If you could go to the next page, please. Um, neck restraint, if you could highlight that portion from that down to unconscious neck restraint. Okay. There are various types of neck restraints that were authorized at the time, is that right? Yes. And uh, neck restraint uh, was defined as compressing one or both sides of a neck, person's neck with an arm or a leg, is that right? Yes. But without applying any direct pressure to the trachea, the airway, that needs to be protected? Yes. Right. And there were two types of neck restraints that were authorized, conscious neck restraint and unconscious neck restraint. 
Yes. And the objective of the uh, unconscious neck restraint, the second one would be to have the person actually pass out. That is correct. And, and under uh, certain circumstances uh, in which um, uh, the officer was in fear of uh, grave bodily harm or death, that would be authorized. Is that right? Yes. And conscious neck restraints uh, were more with the neck restraint with the intent to control, but not to render the subject unconscious. Is that right? Yes. Uh, by applying light to moderate pressure. Is that right? That is correct. Yes. And if you could uh, go to Roman 2 on the same policy, highlight that. Okay. Conscious neck restraint uh, can be used for someone who is actively resisting, correct? Yes. And an unconscious neck restraint could be used for a person who is using, uh, exhibiting active aggression or to save a person's life. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Or in a subject who is um, exhibiting active resistance if lesser attempts would have uh, or would likely to be ineffective. Is that right? Yes. But not no not uh, neck restraints were not to be used against persons who were merely passively resisting. Correct. That is correct. Now I'd like to draw your attention to May 25, 2020. Uh, can you tell the jury when you first learned of the incident involving the defendant, uh, officers Tao, Lane, and King, and George Floyd? Um, on Monday um, evening, around 9 p.m., back on May 25th, uh, 2020, uh, I received a call. I was at my, my residence and I received a call from one of my, uh, I believe it was a deputy chief, who had uh, informed me that um, Minneapolis police officers uh, had responded to 38th in Chicago. Um, and while attempting to take someone into custody, um, that, uh, which I learned now to be Mr. Floyd, um, um, they believed that he would not make it or survive. And so uh, he was being transported via ambulance uh, to, at that time, Hennepin County Medical Center. Um, and while um, at least the information I had that evening at 9 p.m., um, at that time at least was, I was told was still alive, um, I decided to uh, contact the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. And they are a state agency that conducts our critical incidents. Uh, I deemed that this would be a critical incident and it has been our protocol to uh, alert them uh, and they would conduct that um, investigation. So I made that call to the BCA uh, to have them start to conduct this critical incident. Did you then proceed to City Hall? Um, I should also say that I um, right after that call, I notified uh, Minneapolis Mayor Jacob Fry to say that this is a situation we have at least right now and that I would brief him um, as I received more information. I, I then proceeded to leave my residence and I um, uh, went directly to my office in City Hall. When you arrived at City Hall, uh, do you recall seeing any uh, video images or footage of this event? Um, the first time that I saw a video of the event um, was after I was notified that um, Mr. Floyd uh, had now been was now deceased, and so I had asked uh, my deputy chief to pull up what I, knowing the area really well and knowing that there's usually a camera, a city-owned camera, uh, at that location, I asked him to uh, locate that video so that I could review it. Okay. And it, that's what we would refer to as the milestone camera, or milestone footage? That is correct. Okay. Did you watch the footage from the milestone camera that evening? I did watch that. Okay. Can you describe for the jury what you saw when you watched the footage? Um, when I first viewed this milestone video, um, what I 
was able to see, and I should just note that um, it was from a distance uh, from where the officers were with Mr. Floyd. And so all I could really see were the back sides of the officers. Uh, there was also no audio uh, to this milestone video. And so um, I viewed that video uh, in its entirety and uh, quite frankly, there was really nothing in terms of the actions of, of at least again, this non-audio video that really jumped out at me. Uh, after a few minutes, it, it seemed um, a paramedics vehicle pulled up to the scene and it was at that time for the first time that I uh, saw a glimpse of Mr. Floyd when paramedics placed him, placed his body on the gurney and um, uh, transported him away from the scene. Uh, but that was really uh, my first uh, observation of that incident from that, from that night. At some point, did you become aware of another video that had been taken by a bystander? Yes, uh, uh, probably close to midnight, a community member had contacted me and said, uh, Chief, uh, almost verbatim, but said, Chief, have you seen the video of your officer choking and killing that, that man? at 30th in Chicago. And so once I heard um, that statement, I just knew it wasn't the same milestone camera video uh, that I had saw. And um, eventually, within minutes after that, I saw for the first time uh, what is now known as the, uh, the bystander video. Fair to say that this was a much uh, closer video and it had audio? Yes, this, um, I was able to see the occurrence, see um, the, the officers involved. Um, I was able to actually see Mr. Floyd. I was actually able to hear um, what was occurring. And um, I was also able to get a better understanding of the length of time, the duration of the call, the incident, yes. Now, uh, prior to testifying today, have you now reviewed the bystander video, Facebook video in its entirety? Yes, I have. You've also reviewed and re reviewed milestone footage? Yes, I have. And have you reviewed the body-worn camera uh, footage worn by officers Tao, King, Lane, and the defendant? Yes, I have. Now, uh, First, uh, I want to show you what's been received as Exhibit 17. Do you recognize Exhibit 17 to be an image taken from the bystander video that you reviewed? Yes, I do. Now, sir, um, based upon your review of all of the information that you just mentioned, um, do you believe that the defendant followed Dep departmental policy 5-304 regarding de-escalation? I absolutely do not agree with that. Okay. And how so? Um, that action um, is not de-escalation. And when we talk about uh, the framework of our sanctity of life, and when we talk about the principles and values that we have, that that action um, goes contrary to uh, to what we're taught. As you reflect on Exhibit 17, I must ask you: Is this a trained Minneapolis Police Department defensive tactics technique? It is not. Well, we read the uh, departmental policy on neck restraints. Is this a neck restraint? Um. um the conscious neck restraint by policy mentions light to moderate pressure. When I look at Exhibit 17 um, and when I look at the facial expression of, of, of Mr. Floyd, that does not appear in any way, shape, or form that that is light to moderate pressure. So is it your belief then that this particular 
uh, form of restraint, if that's what you, if that's what we'll call it, uh, uh, in fact violates departmental policy. I absolutely agree that violates our policy. Are you aware now that the defendant maintained this position on George Floyd for nine minutes and 29 seconds? I am aware of that. I believe you testified that force has to be reasonable when it's applied at the beginning and through the entire encounter. Is that right? That is correct. Is what you see in Exhibit 17, in your opinion, within Minneapolis Police Departmental Policy 5-300 authorizing the use of reasonable force? It is not. And why not? That is, that is, uh, it has to be objectively reasonable. We have to take into account uh, the circumstances, information, the threat to the officer, the threat to others, um, and we, um, the severity of that. Uh, so that is not uh, part of our policy. That is not what we teach, and uh, that should be condoned. When do you believe or do you have a belief as to when this restraint, the restraint on the ground that you viewed, should have stopped? Once Mr. Floyd, and this is based on my viewing of the, the, the videos, um, once Mr. Floyd had stopped resisting, and certainly once he was um, uh, in distress and trying to verbalize that, um, that, that should have stopped. Um, there's, there's an initial reasonableness in trying to just get him under control over the, in the first few seconds, but, but uh, once there was no longer any resistance, and clearly when Mr. Floyd was no longer responsive and even motionless, to continue to apply that level of force to a person proned out, handcuffed behind their back, um, that that in no way, shape, or form is anything that um, uh, is by policy, is not part of our training, and it is certainly not part of our ethics or our values. Sir, based on your review of the video and based on your own experience and training as an MPD officer, did you see signs during the encounter that Mr. Floyd was exhibiting um, indicia of being in medical distress? Yes. Yes. And you saw at one point, I think you just testified that Mr. Floyd was unresponsive. That is correct. And uh, that officers, were you aware that officers couldn't find a pulse? Could you repeat that, sir? And were you aware that officers at the time of the restraint were unable to find a pulse? Yes, I was aware of that. And so stated. I was aware that the officers were not able to find a pulse, yes. Did you see the defendant uh, or any of the officers attempt to provide first aid to Mr. Floyd? I did not see any of the defendants try to attempt to provide first aid to Mr. Floyd. The defendant did not try CPR. He did not start chest compressions. Objection, uh, Stan is leading. Rephrase. Did you see them? Prov did you see them provide any medical attention? I did not. Then, based on Lily's observations, uh, do you have an opinion as to whether the defendant violated MPD departmental policy 7-350 by failing to render aid to Mr. Floyd? I, I agree that uh, the defendant violated our policy in terms of rendering aid. Thank you. Uh, I have no further questions at this time, Your Honor. If you could please take me to the note. Mr. Nelson.
Good afternoon, Chief Arredondo. Good afternoon, Councilor. Thank you for being here this afternoon and this morning. Thank you. Um, a few follow-up questions for you regarding uh, this incident. Your, deter your determinations today are in reference to employment policies uh, and via Mr. Chauvin's actions violating the departmental employment policies, correct? That is correct. Now, as the police chief, I assume that you're not out on the street day to day arresting people. That is correct. Can you just give me a general sense? When's the last time that you've actually, I don't mean to be dismissive, but actually arrested a suspect? It's been many years, sir. Yeah. Yes. Your, your role as the Minneapolis police chief is sort of grander in its scope, right? I mean, it's... It's, it's um, large in context and, and uh, the operations of the uh, department, yes. And part of that job is to be sort of aware of issues in policing, kind of policy changes, use of force changes, all of these things under fall under the umbrella of your role as the chief. Agreed? Yes. And you're, you're sort of the general in a sense, right? Formulating the, the plan for your police department. And, and delegating some of those to our, our subject matter experts, yes. Correct. Um, when you talk about training of a police officer, you would also include um, the, the training that the Minneapolis Police Department uh, goes through, but you may go to other trainings out, out of state, listen to speakers talking about issues that confront policing, right? Yes. As well as maybe a homicide detective will get permission to travel to a, an interviewing a suspect type of a training in some other state or location, right? Yes. And so there's, there is a variability within the training depending upon your role as a, in, uh, in the police department, right? Yes. So the, you've got sort of your rank and file basic patrol officers and they go through all of the trainings that you've described, the defensive tactics, medical assistance or basic uh, medical training, um, crisis intervention, things that we've been talking about here today, right? Yes. And then the investigative type officers, they may, may go to some addition, they have to go through that training, but they may go through some additional training in terms of how to interview suspects or how to properly collect evidence, et cetera, unique to their role, right? Yes. And then you as the police chief or those who are in the more management or administrative side of the police department, you go to the, the kind of the big picture uh, training sometimes. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. All right. Um, so I want to review with you um, a few of the policies that we've already talked about today. If we could turn, take this down for the moment, Your Honor. Um, first of all, I'd like to show you what has been introduced as Exhibit 216, 216, which is the use of force policy uh, for the City of Minneapolis Police Department. Yes. We've discussed this. And I know that kind of what we did a little earlier is we kind of jumped around from part to part, but I'd like to walk through some of these issues uh, in a little bit more linear fashion if we could. So you've described um, under policy 5-301.01 that the Fourth Amendment's reasonableness standard applies to the use of force in Minneapolis, uh, of the Minneapolis Police Department, agreed? Yes. And that goes on to say that MPD employees shall only use the amount of force that is objectively reasonable and it continues in light of the facts and circumstances known to that employee at the time the force is used, correct? Yes. So the reasonableness standard or the objectively reasonable standard applies to the facts and circumstances that are known by the officer at the time the force is being used, correct? Yes. 
Now, 5-302 gives some definitions in terms of uh, the use of force, and it differentiates between active aggression and active resistance. Can you describe the difference between active resistance, excuse me, active aggression and active resistance? Um, active aggression, uh, behavior initiated by the subject uh, that may or may not uh, be in response to police efforts to bring the person to custody or control. Uh, the act of aggression when presenting behaviors that constitute an assault or in the circumstances reasonably indicate that an assault or an injury to any person is likely to occur at any moment. That's so for act of aggression. Yep, let me just stop you there. That's active aggression. So that's where a suspect is essentially fighting with a police officer or doing something that is aggressive behaviorally speaking. Agreed? Yes. And that, that is aggressive in its nature. Yes. Now, can you read active resistance? Uh, active resistance is a response to police efforts to bring a person into custody or control for detainment or arrest. Uh, subject engages in active resistance when engaging in physical actions or verbal behavior reflecting an attention to make it more difficult for officers to achieve actual physical control. So essentially what we're talking about here is behavior that may or may not be physical in its nature that simply makes it harder for an officer to take a person into custody. Agreed? Yes. And sometimes that is maybe n not p uh, uh, trying to punch the officer, but pulling away or hiding his arms or doing something that just makes it more difficult physically, right? Yes. And sometimes it's, you're not going to take me alive, you dirty cop. You know, like they're saying something uh, to, to prevent the officer from arresting. Yes. Right? So they're using their words, they're using their behaviors. Is it common, based upon your experience, for people to enjoy being taken into custody? Do people, no. do people like to be arrested? Typically not. Right. And in your experience, is it common practice for, for people who are being arrested to say things in an effort to try to get the officer to not arrest them? That certainly occurs, yes. Right. My mom is homesick, I need to get home to my kids. There may be words that they use to try to convince an officer to not arrest them, right? Yes. Now you would also agree that there is a difference between being arrested and being detained, agreed? There can be, right. yes. So an officer in certain circumstances is permitted to uh, expand the scope of the original intervention. Would you agree with that? Objection made. You can restate. Let me, let me try. Yeah. When an officer um, approaches a situation, and it, let's assume it's a, a relatively minor offense, is it possible that that minor offense can grow in its scope of investigation? Yes. And it's actually quite common for that to happen, correct? Yes. An officer makes a traffic stop for speeding or something like that, smells drugs in the car, searches the car, finds a large amount of drugs, finds guns, etc. right? Yes. So what starts out as a relatively minor incident, a traffic ticket, can turn into a felony arrest, correct? It could. And that, again, happens quite regularly. Yes. So when an officer, well, let me back up a second, you would agree that being a police officer is a pretty dangerous profession? Um, there are inherent dangers with it. Um, I've never had to get in a fight with anybody in my life, in, in my job, right? But in your job, it's probably more probable that that will happen. Would you yes. agree with that? Now, Talking about the use of force, when an officer approaches a motor vehicle, is that considered to be one of the most dangerous um, initiations of contact between an officer and a citizen? Um, I don't have the um, exact statistics on it. It's certainly um, an encounter that officers are certainly more heightened. Um, I, I know that uh, domestic response calls can also have a sense of heightened awareness for officers, um, but it's certainly something, a, a traffic stop certainly 
raises an awareness for officers, yes, for their safety. And that's because um, that's that suspect's sort of space, right? The officer doesn't know what's in the car or in the apartment during a domestic situation. You're walking into someone else's territory, so to speak, right? Uh, yes. Right. And so there could be guns, there could be knives, there could be any number of instruments that could bring harm to a police officer, right? There's that potential. Now, obviously, there's tens of thousands of traffic stops, and there's not, not every traffic stop turns violent. I'm not suggesting that, but that does happen regularly. Agreed? That the traffic stops turn violent. Uh, yes, they can. So when we're talking about the use of force policy under 5-301.01, the last sentence that wasn't read before is the force used shall be consistent with current MPD training. Agreed? Yes. Now there's a difference between a policy change and like a best practice change. Would you agree with that? Can you clarify? Sure. So there are certain times where the policy, it's with respect to the use of force, may specifically change to prohibit a particular style or use of force, right? Yes. So thinking about in the old days, officers used to wear like weighted gloves to make their punches more effective, right? Yes. The policy changed and prohibited that, correct? Yes. And then there's a difference between, say, the evolution of defensive tactics. Would you agree with that? I mean, the, the, tr the defensive yeah. tactics training you received in 1989 was much different than the defensive tactics training that's taught now, right? Yes. And I believe it was maybe 15 years ago uh, that the Minneapolis Police Department started moving towards more body weight control, sort of this jujitsu uh, training as opposed to physically striking people to gain compliance. And are you referencing policy or, or training? Training. I believe so. About 15, 10, 15 years ago. Agreed. Yes. And that was sort of highlighting the evolution, as you kind of described it in your direct examination, of policing since you've become a police officer. That's yes. one way it's evolved. Yes. And when something changes per policy, can't wear weighted gloves anymore, for example, that's it, no more. Agreed? Yes, I agree, yes. But if the policy, if, if training, for example, evolves into a best practice, it doesn't prevent an officer from learning a, a technique he learned earlier in his career. It just may not be the best practice anymore. So I, I pause just to, when you say that they're learning something, but if it's, if it's not in alignment with our policy, then that would not be prohibited. If, if, if I'm well, hearing so you correctly. Let me, let me try to explain. Like, so if an officer was trained in a particular handcuffing technique and then they go to their defensive tactics training and they say, this is a better way to handcuff a suspect, it's not a policy change, it's just a best practice change. And they can still use the old way they did it. Uh, it would, uh, Counselor, it would, it would have to be something that the training staff would have to, uh, not just an officer saying, I want to do it this way, and I mean, it's something that would have to be authorized through our, our training right. so staff. We, yes. So we could talk about that kind of thing with the training, the use of force defensive tactics training, right? That would be the better place to talk, better people to talk to about that? Yes, yes. Okay, all right. Now, when we're talking about active aggression and active resistance, sometimes those two things are happening simultaneously. Agreed? It can be, yes. So now we were talking then about, um, again, the Graham versus Connor case. 
and how that is incorporated into the Minneapolis Police Department policy. And I'm showing you Exhibit 217 now. It should be up in front of you. What we're basically talking about was a United States Supreme Court decision that, that outlined the objectively reasonable use of force standard, right? Yes. And Graham versus Connor is not limited to those three factors that you were read before, right? The Graham versus Connor analysis. Yes, correct. Those are three that are kind of listed, but ultimately it's not an all-inclusive list of considerations for the reasonableness of the use of force. Agreed? That would be my understanding, yes. And in fact, what the policy reads is that the reasonableness of a particular use of force must be judged from the perspective of the reasonable officer on the scene rather than with the 2020 vision of hindsight, right? Yes. So we're looking at it in the instant and the moment based upon the objective standard, right? Yes. Now it also, the policy also includes that the calculus of reasonableness must embody allowance for the fact that police officers are often forced to make split-second judgments in circumstances that are tense, uncertain, and rapidly evolving about the amount of force that is necessary in a particular situation, right? Yes. And that's because when officers go to a situation, kind of like what we talked about before, what can be very initially very minor can grow into something major. Agreed? Yes. Now we like to show you exhibit 219. You read um, a part of 5-304, which is threatening the use of force and de-escalation. And I want to talk to you a little bit about de-escalation. Um, have you heard the term sometimes you have to escalate to de-escalate? You ever heard that phrase? I have not heard that. Okay. So in here you talk about, or the policy talks about, um, that officers shall consider verbally announcing their intent to use force including displaying an authorized weapon as a threat of force, right? So sometimes an officer has to take out his gun, say, hey, I mean, that's a, that's a use of force in that instance, right? Yes. And if you don't listen to me, you know, I'm going to use force. It's a pretty clear indication that force could be used when you have a gun pointing at you. Would you agree with that? Yes. But other things such as chemical irritants or tasers, it's not limited to just a firearm. Right? Yes. And so sometimes what you have what an officer has to do is command the presence, right? They have to take control of the situation. Yes. And sometimes that's not particularly attractive, is it? Could you explain? Sure. Uh, the use of force is not something that people like to watch generally, right? Objection, speculation, and argument. Sustained. Would you agree that the use of force is not an attractive notion? I would say that um, use of force is something that um, most officers would rather not use, yes. Right. And you described in your direct examination how the single greatest way that the Minneapolis Police Department could be judged is based upon how the public perceives its use of force. Yes. Right? So it, it has a tendency to garner a lot of attention. It can. So much so that citizens have become more um, prone to record observed interactions with police, right? Yes. Something that you didn't have to deal with back in 1989, right? Yes. So essentially what this policy 5-304 in terms of threatening the use of force, it's contained within this de-escalation concept, right? So sometimes you have to display a weapon to gain command so that you can de-escalate, right? Yes. 
Now when we're talking about, is it fair to say that pretty much every single one of these use of force of policies contains some phrase, if reasonable or if practical, there's limitations on the use of force, right? Yes, there are limitations, yes. And, there, and it's situation by situation, right? Yes. And then again, if we go back and look at the language of the Graham versus Connor and the policy that's contained by Minneapolis Police Department, it's uh, the use of force has no precise objective singular rule. It's different in every case. Yes. So the, the for example, in the de-escalation policy 5-304B1, de-escalation is advisable when it is safe and feasible, correct? Yes. And sometimes de-escalation, again, includes the use of force, right? The use of force can be a de-escalation tactic. I was, and Counselor, I was thinking of your example of displaying your 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 weapon, and so I don't have a, a lot of knowledge in terms of physical force being used to actually de-escalate a situation, uh, but the threatening use of force or threatening verbally, right. that's, I'm more familiar with that. Okay. Yeah. So again, if we were to talk to the use of force or defensive tactics. Objection. Argumentative. Overruled. They would be the best source of that. Overruled. Yes. But the purpose of de-escalation, agreed, is to attempt to slow down or stabilize the situation so that more time, options, and resources become available to the officer. Yes. Basically, slow down, everybody kind of calm down, let's try to relax, right? Yes. But it's a lot more, the, de the process of de-escalation is not just trying to talk somebody out of doing something. There are actions that are important. There may be reactions that are important. And the, and the de-escalation policy includes some examples of those things, right? Yes. Such as placing barriers between an uncooperative subject and an officer. Yes. And sometimes those barriers are another officer, right? Yes containing a threat, right? I mean, that's one of the examples in the in policy. Yes. By containing a threat, that can include physically restraining someone so that they don't upset another person, right? Yes. Or cause another person to have a violent reaction towards them or officers, right? Yes. Moving from a position that exposes officers to potential threats to a safer position, right? So kind of retreating in certain circumstances. Yes. Reducing exposure to a potential threat using distance, cover, or concealment, right? So hiding, say, behind a squad car, right? Yes. Avoiding physical confrontation. That's, a, that's probably a pretty big one, right? Yes. And using verbal techniques uh, to calm an agitated subject or promote rational decision making that's kind of down towards the end yes and lastly calling additional resources right yes and we talked about Showing you Exhibit 230, which is the emergency medical response. You agree that the policy requires Minneapolis police employees to request an emergency medical service as soon as practical, right? Yes. If a person comes into contact having an acute medical crisis and any delay in treatment could potentially aggravate the severity of the, of the 
uh, medical crisis, right? Yes. So sometimes officers will call for EMS, not thinking it's a major issue. When suddenly it becomes apparent, they can step up or request a quicker response from EMS, right? Yes. And that is something that an officer can do to m ensure the medical treatment of uh, the suspect that they have or the person that they're in, in contact with, right? Uh, to, to ensure, I'm sorry, to ensure. <clears throat> sorry, it's been a long week. To ensure the um, medical condition of the suspect, to help with them. Yes. Right. Get EMS there as quickly as is possible. Right? Yes. Now we didn't talk a little. We didn't talk about the maximal restraint uh, technique. You're familiar with the policies surrounding that. Yes. I'm going to show to you what's been admitted as Exhibit Two Two Five. Can you describe what the maximal restraint technique is? Yes, uh, Counselor, the, the maximal restraint technique is, uh, has often been referred to as uh, the hobble. And that is a, um, it's a method of if officers are dealing with a, uh, typically a combative or aggressive person in order to protect them or even property, uh, it's placing, uh, basically attaching a um, uh, a cord of the legs to the waist to so that the person, the individual, um, does not have free movement of their legs. Uh, so it's securing them, again, uh, for usually by their ankles. Uh, if you're prone, bringing that up to your waist and securing it. Um, the maximal restraint technique or the hobble, though, um, if it's used, a supervisor has to respond to the scene uh, you cannot transport anyone prone in that position due to the risks of um, uh, the breathing. Uh, and so, but that is the uh, counselor, that would be my understanding of the MRT or the maximal restraint technique. So you talked a little bit in terms of the use of force, how officers are kind of reevaluating their use of force from time to time, right? They yes. should be at least, right? And so if officers decide to use the maximal restraint technique and then decide, hey, we know, or and then later decide not to use it, right, that is kind of adjusting that use of force. I would, Counselor, with, with some, some clarity, um, I don't know if that, what I, what I mean by that is if you were to have a person handcuffed and prone on their stomach on the ground and pavement, and you had two officers, let's say, securing their legs to the back of the waist, you in a way are still imploring, employing what that technique is about anyway. So, um, so th there, there can be some variances to that. Sure. If that makes sense. It does. So let's assume that you've got two officers pulling the legs forward, essentially employing that uh, aversion, so to speak, of the maximal restraint. But then they release and they say, we're not gonna, we're not gonna hobble this person. We're not gonna employ the MRT. You're going from a decision to employ that technique backwards down the, s the continuum in terms of the use of force. Would you agree with that? And counselor, I just just because these these types of uses of force can be problematic in terms of there's a high risk to them. So meaning that um, if you're going to take that initiative to do that alternative version in the first place, um, you'd want to get a hold of a supervisor because something could happen in terms of that that uh, that person and so I'm not just wanted, yeah. I'm not asking in terms of the policy I'm asking in terms of sort of the the use of force and the critical decision-making model right you, you described how the use of force you have to go through this critical decision-making model how much force am I going to use and sometimes you have to back off the use of force Agreed? Yes. And sometimes you have to go forward with the use of force, meaning you use even more force. Yes. Right? And it's a, this constant reevaluation. 
Agreed? Yes. And so when you have officers who make a decision that the, f the facts and circumstances would warrant using the hobble device, but then later decide not to employ that device, that is that critical decision-making model in action. Agreed? Yes. And it would be a reduction in the use of force. It may still require supervisors to be on scene policy-wise, but it is a reduction in the use of force. Agreed? And Councilor, just are we talking specifically the events of May 25th? I'm talking oh, generally. In general, yes. But you would agree, ultimately, that all of the Minneapolis Police Department policies relevant to the use of force, emergency medical uh, response, uh, emergency medical treatment, all of these policies are, by their very language, are situationally dependent, right? They all say, if the circumstances allow, if time permits, if it's safe, they have a qualifier to them. Agree? Yes, I'd agree with that. I'm going to show you Exhibit 231. Which is at the at the bottom of Exhibit 231 is the crisis intervention uh, policy. And the second page includes the definition. Could you read the entire definition of what a crisis is? Uh, yes. Uh, an event or situation where an individual's safety and health are threatened by behavioral health challenges to include mental illness, developmental disabilities, substance use, or overwhelming stressors. A crisis can involve an individual's perception or experience of an event or situation as an intolerable difficulty that exceeds the individual's current resources and coping mechanisms and may include unusual stress in his or her life that renders him or her unable to function as he or she normally would. The crisis may, but not necessarily, result in an upward trajectory or intensity culminating in thoughts or acts that are possibly dangerous to himself, herself, and or others. All right. So generally speaking, again, not relevant to the May 25th of 2020 incident. We'll get there in a minute. But when we talk about a, a general police response, sometimes the police may respond to something and the person they're dealing with is not in a crisis. Agreed? Yes. But other people may be perceiving what is happening, and it could become a crisis to that person. Objection. Can you, if you could rephrase. Sure. People who observe, uh, would you say that people who observe police interactions with people, especially the more physical or use of force types, that's a, that could turn into a crisis for an observer? Sustain is calling for speculation. So in terms of the definition of crisis, a crisis may involve an individual's perception or experience of an event or situation as an intolerable difficulty that exceeds that individual's current resources and coping mechanisms, right? Yes. That doesn't necessarily mean that you are res the person with whom you are arresting or having contact with is going to be the person who will experience the crisis. Agreed? Overall. Um, in counsel, I just respectfully, so you're, you're saying that the person who's witnessing a situation with the officers, that situation may cause them to be in crisis? Correct. Could potentially. Right. And the crisis may but not necessarily result in an upward trajectory or intensity culminating in thoughts or acts that are possibly dangerous to him, her, or others, right? And, and Counselor, just, uh, this is the person who's, who's watching this? Right. It could. Right. So people are watching what 
something that they appear to believe or they believe is wrong or contrary to police policy that may cause them to get upset and that level of upset or that level of volatility may grow throughout the course of the interaction. Objection, irrelevant, calls for speculation and beyond the scope. Well, it's within the scope. It, it could. Because ultimately, part of the training that Minneapolis police officers have to go through is how to deal with crowds who observe police interactions, right? Yes. Crowds that may be upset with police interaction, right? Yes. I mean, there, there are classes through the training academy. There are classes through in-service specifically dealing with how to deal with crowd control, right? Yes. And all of this is to revert, in part, back to that de-escalation process as well, right? Yes. So part of it, as a crowd grows or becomes more upset, part of it is to try to de-escalate, which can involve trying to avoid a physical confrontation, right? Yes, it could. Yes. Trying to st stay safe, concealed, and covered, right? Yes. Not yelling back at somebody, not engaging in them with them verbally, right? Yes. And sometimes when an officer tries to de-escalate a situation and someone is so upset, right? Sometimes they don't hear what the officer tells them. Would you agree with that? Objection, speculation. That calls for speculation, it is sustained. Is it possible, generally speaking, that someone's own crisis may prevent them from hearing what an officer is telling them? That could happen. The, hold on. The objection is sustained. The answer will be stricken. So you've, you, you testified that uh, you've watched the body cameras, correct? Yes. going to show you, I don't know, Mr. Slisher, this is uh, Exhibit 1008, which is a 10 second, approximately 5 second clip of Alexander King's uh, body-worn camera that's already in, 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 and I gave you a copy of it. Is this in evidence? Not yet, no. I'm just telling you, first and foremost, that's what it is. I'm going to show you on your screen uh, a short clip of a video to see if this would be contained in the what you've watched. And I need to... You would agree that that appears to be taken from one of the officer's body cameras uh, May 25th, 2020, at approximately 20, 25, and 33 seconds. Yes. In again, watching it without sound. Do you, uh, at this point, did you see a, what appeared to be someone's a reflection in the back of the squad car there? Uh, Counselor, I did, I did not. Okay. And it might just be because of the brevity of the video. But. Yeah, it's unfortunate. If you look in the upper left-hand corner at the bumper of the squad video. Use the cursor to circle it for him. I'm sorry? Use the, cur the cursor or the stylus to... Oh, sure. That's right. I forgot all this fancy technology here. see the legs of someone in reflecting? Yes. And so you would uh, agree that this appears to be a short clip from one of the officer's body-worn cameras on May 25th of 2020? Yes. You've seen these before. You see what appears to be Mr. Floyd's arm 
uh, there by the back of the squat cut, right? Yes. So I would offer exhibit 1008. Any objection? No objection. 1008 is received. And if I may publish. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to reply. Do you hear our voice say we've got an ambulance coming? Yes. Oops, sorry if we could take that down. Now, uh, policy. 5-311, let's talk a little bit about 5-311, which is the neck restraint policy. This. Good time to break for our 20 minute mid afternoon break. We'll reconvene around 3.20. Thank you.
Chief, another reminder, you're still under oath. Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, we uh, Before the break, we were going to be talking about um, the neck use of neck restraints and the policies that permitted neck restraints. That is Minneapolis Police Policy 5-311, correct? Yes. Right. Exhibit 224, you have that in front of you there? Yes. So there are, uh, is a difference, the policy draws a difference between a chokehold and a neck restraint, correct? Yes. A chokehold is actually from the front obstructing or occluding the trachea and airway of the suspect, correct? Yes. And per Minneapolis policy, that's considered a lethal use of force or a deadly use of force, right? Yes. And that's because it has a high rate of death associated with it, right? That is correct. It's more dangerous to, to from the front. Yes. It also differentiates between a chokehold and a neck restraint, agreed? Yes. And a neck restraint is specifically defined as compressing one or both sides of a person's neck with an arm or leg without applying direct pressure to the trachea or airway. Agreed? Um, based upon the policy, I, I think it's important to note, Counselor, that the light to moderate pressure. Is well. Right. Yes. Understood. Yes. Light to moderate pressure. Yes. And I'm assuming that you don't have a degree in physics. I do not, Counselor. Okay. And in terms of the amount of pressure or force that was actually applied to Mr. Floyd, you would not be qualified to speak to that. Agreed? Agreed. <clears throat> but then it, it also differentiates between a conscious and an unconscious neck restraint, right? Yes. And a conscious neck restraint is where you have someone who is resisting you and you apply that neck restraint in an effort to simply gain control of that person, but they stay conscious, correct? Yes. And an unconscious neck restraint is where you actually render the subject unconscious, right? Yes. Both were permitted under Minneapolis police policy on May 25th of 2020, agreed? Yes. And ultimately, uh, you have, if I understand what you have, the opinion that you have formed, you have formed the opinion that this was a neck restraint that was being employed. Yes. <clears throat> and you have also formed the opinion that this was an unconscious neck restraint. Is that correct? Or excuse me, a conscious neck restraint. Yes. Okay. You're familiar, you testified on direct examination that uh, it is contrary to the training that you've received to place your neck or your knee on a subject's neck. Counselor, if I can clarify, um, it is contrary to our training to indefinitely place um, your knee on a prone, handcuffed individual for an indefinite period of time. For So the issue that you take with it is the length of time? Counselor, the, there's a couple of issues, and, and one of those, again, is, uh, as you noted, uh, receiving the information. Um, is the person a threat to the officers or others? What is the severity of the crime? Uh, are you reevaluating and assessing the person's medical condition? So all of that critical thinking, um, that's, so that's really key for me in terms of why I vehemently disagree that that was the appropriate use of force for that situation okay. on May 25th. Now, when we talk about that crit critical decision-making model, that critical decision-making model doesn't only apply to the specific subject that you have under your control, correct? And Counselor, just and so we're talking about, is this the bystanders? Would you mind moving the microphone back just a little? It's Your Honor, my apologies. 
Uh, no problem. I think we're just we getting a, got a loud voice. That's right. Well, I'm, I, yeah, I'm talking about bystanders. I'm talking about other officers. I'm talking about other things that come into play in terms of the officer's critical decision making. And I apologize, Counselor, if you could just re rephrase that question sure. again. When an officer is engaged in the use of force, and I'll just phrase it as a yes or no, their attention is not exclusively necessarily focused on the subject of, of for whom they have in custody. Agreed? Or disagree? The officer that, Counselor, the officer that is engaging in the use of force may be viewing other, other matters? Correct. That would be yes. Right, and in fact, that's what the, the de-escalation model talks about, is looking at things from a tactical advantage or disadvantage, agreed? It's one of the portions of it. Right, specifically in the policy, de-escalation has to be applied assuming that it's safe to do so, right? Yes. And all other tactical considerations, agreed? That's what the policy says. Yes. And in terms of that, those decision-making, an officer, it's not a singular decision-making process that's happening in the course of an arrest, agreed? Yes. So an officer has to be concerned about other things that are known to him at that time. Agreed? Yes. So some of those things would be, what just happened between me and this subject a few minutes ago? Right? Yes. I just fought with this subject a few minutes ago. I'm talking generally here. I just fought with, fought with this person generally a few minutes ago. He now seems to be not resisting, but that doesn't mean he can't resist again. Right? Yes. Even if he's handcuffed, right? Yes. And so even if he's handcuffed, someone can still, pres they, they're not threatless if they're handcuffed. Agreed? And Counselor, this is just a general, general hypothetical. Right. Uh, yes. Right. Someone who is handcuffed can be equally as, as a threat to an officer as someone who's not handcuffed. Yes. They can kick and they could bite, they can spit, they can do all sorts of things, agreed? Yes. Now, in terms of the use, so I just want to make sure you form the opinion that this was a conscious, an, excuse me, an unconscious neck restraint, right? A uh, counselor? In the, on May 25th of 2020. That it was a conscious neck restraint? Conscious neck restraint. Yes. Okay. Now, Again, in this whole de-escalation, officers have to take into consideration the safety of the crowd, right? Yes. They have to take into account the reactions of the crowd, whether they're angry or hostile or just simply watching, right? Yes. That's all part of this critical decision-making model, right? Yes. They have to be aware of their surroundings, right? Generally yes. speaking. Being on a busy street versus being on a, in a park, right? Yes. Different decision go into that, right? Yes. Knowing that I have other officers that are in place and may be at risk as well, right? Yes. So there's lots of, it, the, the critical decision making model is not singular in its application. That's correct. Lots of information coming in very rapidly, right? Yes. So I'm going to show you first, and I believe by stipulation, or at least without objection, I'm going to play a few minutes, or excuse me, a few seconds of Ms. Frazier's Facebook video. Uh, so at this time, I'd offer Exhibit 1018. No objection. Uh, permission Ten to publish. 1018 is received. You may publish. Pause it here, sorry. This appears to be sort of that time, that picture that was shown to you earlier, Exhibit 19. This is that general time, uh, time frame that that picture appears to be taken from. Counselor, yes, I'm sorry. Was that here for this a question? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. This, uh, this appears to be that, that image you were shown on direct examination, that static Exhibit 19, right? Yes. 
shows Officer Chauvin, shows Officer Flo or excuse me, Mr. Floyd, it shows Officer Tao. Yes. And it shows the perspective of the of the um, Miss Frazier's phone. Chief, are you um, familiar with the concept of camera perspective bias? I am not, Counselor. Okay. Now again, if I may take that down, by stipulation I'm going to show that same time frame, exhibit 2000, excuse me, 1019, that same perspective from Mr. King's body camera, and I'd offer 1019. 1019. Any objection? No objection. 1019 is received. <laughs> Wish to publish your Agrees, agree it appears to be the same time frame? Yes. All right. Now, lastly, Chief, I'm going to show you one last video. We can take this down, Your Honor. Exhibit, I would offer Exhibit 1020, which is a side-by-side -side of the two. Any objection? No objection. 1020 is received. And permission to publish. Start it over, if that's okay. You would agree, Chief, that from the perspective of Miss Frazier's camera, it appears that Officer Chauvin's knee is on the neck of Mr. Floyd. Yes. Would you agree that from the perspective of Officer King's body camera, it appears that Officer Chauvin's knee was more on Mr. Floyd's shoulder blade? Um, yes. I have no further questions. Mr. Slusher. Thank 
Chief, let's start um, with what you just saw and you testified that the, the particular moment in time uh, that you were viewing Officer King or former Officer King's body worn camera, it appeared at that moment in time that the knee of the defendant was more towards the shoulder blade. Is that right? That is correct. That was at a time where the ambulance had already arrived? Yes. Very shortly before they loaded Mr. Floyd onto the gurney? Is that, that, right? is, that is correct. And in your view of the body-worn camera uh, footage and everything you reviewed prior to testifying today, did you see uh, the defendant's knee uh, anywhere but the neck of Mr. Floyd up until that time? That is correct. And so the knee of Mr. F of the defendant was on Mr. Floyd's neck up until the time you just pointed out. Yes, uh, when I viewed that video portion, um, that is the first time that I'd seen uh, the knee of the defendant on the shoulder blade area. And that was right before the paramedic came? That is correct. Now, looking at uh, and talking about the uh, neck restraint policy, if you could show Exhibit 17, please. Oh. So looking at Exhibit 17, was it your testimony that Exhibit 17 is not a trained MPD neck restraint? Correct, that is my testimony. And I'd like you to reflect on the exhibits that you were shown by defense counsel, exhibits uh, 1008, 1019, and 1020, the, the 10 second clip. Okay. During that period of time, which is you know much later than the point in time we see here, uh, did you see any indication that Mr. Floyd was actively resisting, as that term is defined in Minneapolis Police Department policy. I, I did not um, observe Mr. Floyd to be actively resisting during that time. Did you uh, see, same question, same time period, any indication that Mr. Floyd was being actively aggressive during that 10 second clip that you were just shown? No, I did not observe Mr. Floyd to be actively aggressive during that could you, short video. Could you even say that he was passively resisting at that time that you were shown those exhibits? No, as a matter of fact, as I saw that video, um, I didn't even know if Mr. Floyd was alive at that time. I want to revisit a little bit of the testimony uh, on cross-examination about the use of the MRT or the hobble, right? And if I'm to understand your testimony, you indicated that um, a hobble is a strap that's used to connect a purse, a handcuffed person, their waist, the arms, and the legs to restrain them. Is that right? Yes, that is correct. And what I thought I heard you saying uh, in response to questioning by counsel was that you can use it, you can do an MRT effectively, right, without using a hobble when you're doing the same thing but with your hands. Yes, that is correct. And did I understand your testimony to essentially be that that's what these officers were doing was essentially using the maximal restraint technique but not using the hobble? That is correct. And pursuant to uh, departmental policy, the hobble is the only authorized use, uh, the only authorized way to employ the maximal restraint technique. Is that right? That is correct. Are you aware that the formal use, the use of the actual hobble requires uh, a supervisor to report to the scene and do a force report? Yes, the supervisor must uh, arrive at the scene and do a report. But uh, that would be avoided if the hobble itself wasn't used or? No, if you're still employing that sort of technique, again, with a prone individual handcuffed 
and you're, you're, you're basically doing that maneuver. Uh, and because of the severity of risk to, um, and certainly that would have been to Mr. Floyd, you would have contacted a supervisor. And, and uh, aside from that, I mean, if you're using an MRT, uh, you are supposed to adhere to departmental policy. Is that right? That is correct. And the de Minis uh, Minneapolis departmental policy for the use of the MRT requires an officer to do what as soon as the MRT is applied? Again, because of the severe nature of making sure that that individual can breathe, we have to get that individual into a side recovery position to make sure that their airway is not obstructed. And so that's, that's uh, paramount. So, and that's required by policy and the side recovery position uh, is supposed to be instant, is that right? Immediate. And the, you indicated that uh, it has to do with breathing. Are you you're familiar with the term positional asphyxia? I am. Is that one of the dangers of leaving somebody in a prone handcuffed position uh, for too long? Yes, positional asphyxia, we, we, again, as I mentioned, we cannot transport people in that position if they're prone to handcuffed and there's pressure uh, around their airways or on their back, the, the risk and potential for them um, and us killing them goes up substantially. So that side recovery position is very critically important. I want to follow up on uh, some of the questions about your own personal training and that of different uh, officers in different roles within the Minneapolis Police Department. Different officers can attend uh, other types of training, is that right? Yes. But everybody's required to do in-service training, is that true? That is correct. And regardless of where somebody trains, I mean, the, the rules are the rules, right? Yes. And the policy applies to all MPD officers. Yes. The question was posed regarding the critical decision-making model and the need to take in information. And that's true, correct? Yes. Uh, when we're looking at the proper and authorized use of force under departmental policy, is it fair to say that the amount of force an officer can use depends upon the conduct of the subject, the person upon whom the force is being used? Yes, it's fair to say that. So for example, if you had me in, uh, let's say, uh, a, a dangerous hold, right, would you be able to continue to keep me in a dangerous hold based on something somebody else is doing? I'm sorry, if you could explain that, I'm sorry. So for example, if you found the need to place me in some sort of a hold, that's dangerous. Yes. Uh, but something that you see, say the judge is starting to pick something up to throw at me, would that justify you using more force on me? No. And in terms of uh, de-escalating uh, the crowd, you indicated that there is some um, potential uh, need to de-escalate uh, a crowd, a group of people. Is that right? Yes. Uh, because a group of people can experience something that they find shocking uh, or upsetting, and that can you know, uh, place them in some kind of an emotional state. Is that right? That's correct. And uh, you may need to turn your attention to and de-escalate the crowd. Yes. Would one way, if we can show Exhibit 17, would one way to de-escalate the crowd who's experiencing something shocking to stop doing the thing that's shocking them? Absolutely. I have nothing further. Any recross? Thank you. Uh, very briefly, just one question. There are certain circumstances where an officer has to kind of freeze the situation, evaluate, hold the person until he or she can decide 
what's the safest way to move forward. Agreed? Agreed. Sometimes you just have to kind of hold the person, correct? Yes. And that's something that happens fairly frequently. Agreed? Yes. And so uh, one other question with respect to the policy regarding the maximal restraint technique and putting a person in the, the recovery position or the side recovery position, you said it was immediate. Agreed? As soon as you're able to do so, yes. Right. And that's actually what the policy says is as soon as you're able to do so, right? Yes. And there are certain circumstances under which you may be using force where the, the force has to be dealt with before you can turn your attention to rendering medical aid, right? And counsel, just so that, are we still talking about someone in the recovery position or the hobble? Just or generally. Can you repeat that? I'm sorry. Sure. There are certain circumstances where a use of force needs to be continued for some reason to deal with something else before you can uh, deal or render medical aid. Let me use, give you an example. Yeah. We're in a gun battle, right? You and I are shooting at each other. I'm the cop, you're the bad guy, and you hit my partner. I'm gonna continue to use my force against you before I can go you render medical aid. Counselor, in that hypothetical, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Briefly. Sometimes it's necessary to freeze a scene and to hold an individual, correct? Yes. But you have to do so safely. You have to hold the person safely. Isn't that correct? That is correct. Nothing further. All right, thank you, Chief. You're Your excused. Honor, thank you so much. Next witness. All right. All right, next witness, please. Thank you, Your Honor. The state calls Katie Blackwell. You swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth and nothing but the truth. I do. And if you, if you don't mind taking off your mask, yes. great. Uh, let's begin by having you state your full name and spell each of your names. Okay, Katie, K-A-T-I-E, Marie, M-A-R-I-E, Blackwell, B-L-A-C-K-W-E-L-L. -L. Mr. Slisher. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you employed? Uh, through the Minneapolis Police Department. What is your current position? My current position is the inspector of the 5th uh, Precinct. Right. How long have you been the inspector of the 5th Precinct? Since January 31st this year. What, were your immediate, what was your immediate uh, rank and assignment prior to that? The commander of the training division. Right. Now, I'd like uh, you to tell the jury a little bit about yourself. First, uh, could you tell us about your educational background in law enforcement? Sure. So my two-year associate's degree is in... Uh, law enforcement through Minneapolis Community and Technical College. My four-year uh, bachelor degree is in police science through St. Mary's University. My master's degree is in uh, public safety administration 
from St. Mary's University. I'm a graduate of the Northwestern Police Staff and Command, and I'm just about to complete a two-year uh, course in United States Army Sergeant Majors Academy, which is equivalent to a master's in leader. Uh, so in addition to being a police officer, you're also in the Minnesota National Guard, is that right? I am. At, at what rank? E-9 Sergeant Major. Okay. And uh, just for the uninitiated, can you describe where uh, where that falls within the the ranks of the enlisted? That is the top enlisted rank that you can achieve. How long have you been in the Minnesota National Guard? Uh, over 23 years. Have you ever deployed? I have. Hey, where? Uh, to Bosnia on a peacekeeping mission, and then to Iraq for almost two years on a Operation Iraqi Freedom. Thank you. Can you please uh, tell the jury when you began uh, your law enforcement career with the Minneapolis Police Department? Uh, sure. So in uh, 1999, I worked with the 2nd Precinct Community Response Team in the neighborhood I grew up in, Northeast Minneapolis. And we basically worked on uh, nuisance livability crimes, narcotics related, alcohol related. And then in 2000, I became a community service officer. Um, I was assigned to the 4th Precinct in the SWAT team. In 2002, I became a police officer, and I worked the 1st uh, Precincts, 2nd Precinct, and 3rd Precinct, mostly 911 response patrol. I did um, work for 1st Precinct and 3rd Precinct's uh, community response team, which is, uh, I did a lot of ICE work and narcotics-related investigations. And then I uh, did a little time in Violent Offender Task Force, which is known as Safe Streets. Um, that's high felony violent crimes that we worked. In uh, 2012, I was promoted to sergeant, uh, where I worked sex crimes investigations, and then 4th Precinct Patrol a Supervisor, and then 1st Precinct Patrol Supervisor, mostly overseeing 911 response, and then our community response teams, and uh, foot patrol. And then I went to the assault unit to do investigations, and then Violent Criminal Investigation Team, which was primarily investigating shootings, and then Cold Case Homicide and Homicide Detective. I was then promoted in December 2019 uh, to the rank of Lieutenant. And I should say during that time, I, I led the SWAT Crisis Negotiator Team for five out of the seven years. When I became a Lieutenant, I was assigned to the Training Division uh, to create leadership and professional development programs for the department. And then I, I took on the Field Training Officer Program I was promoted to commander of training in April 14th, 2019, where I oversaw uh, the Police Athletic League, Police Explorers, Community Service Officers, uh, the Academy, Police Academies, the in-service training, uh, overseeing the subject matter experts, uh, the medical support team, range uh, patrol operations, the crisis intervention team, and the use of force team, uh, as well as uh, recruitment hiring background, the 911 call center, uh, court liaison and adult and vulnerable homeless population. Thank you. <clears throat> and uh, as a person who was in uh, command of the uh, training center, uh, are you familiar with you know the basic curriculum that was offered at that center during the time period uh, you oversaw the operations? I was. And uh, were you also familiar with the various um, staff and components who provided training at that center? Yes. Uh, before we get into a, a more thorough description of the training center, I need to ask if you're familiar with an individual by the name of Derek Sh uh, Chauvin. I am. Yeah, how are you familiar with that person? Uh, well, we worked on the same shift. We were community service officers together. Back uh, prior to becoming a police officer? Correct. So you've known this person for approximately how long? Almost 20 years. Okay. Do you recognize uh, Derek Chauvin in the courtroom today? I do. Would you please point to him and describe what he's wearing? Uh, I was sitting over there in a navy blue uh, suit. May the record reflect the witnesses identified the defendant. It will. Now, you and the defendant have uh, worked for the Minneapolis Police Department contemporaneously for uh, nearly 20 years? Correct. When you came into the uh, uh, police department, did you go through academy training? I did. Hey, describe that process. It was a 16-week police academy uh, that we went through. Everything from we learned policy, procedure, investigations, um, defensive tactics, use of force, 
we did a lot of scenarios at the end um, that we had to pass. So it was just a wide curriculum of things, report writing, basically anything that pertained to the job. Okay. And after completing the, the classroom and practical portion of uh, the academy when you took it, what was the next step? Sorry? What was the next step after completing the, the practical uh, exercises at the academy and the classroom training? Oh, so it's a field training program. It's approximately five to six months long that you would ride with the field training officer. And then after you completed that, uh, you were able to get your first assignment? Correct. Oh, I'd like you to please describe first uh, generally the training center. Where is it located uh, within Minneapolis? Sure. So it's uh, our training center is a former elementary school that's located on the north side of Minneapolis. And it's just several classrooms that we use for training, as well as uh, auditorium and a gym if we have to do hands-on or practical exercises. And it was supervised at the commander level or is supervised at the commander level? It is. Can you then describe, you know, currently or at least at the time, uh, uh, say 2020, uh, when you were overseeing it, how is it staffed or the different uh, positions at the training center? So this, there's multiple units out of the Special Operations Center is the, the training facility. Uh, for the training, we had full-time instructors, our use of force um, instructors, our patrol operations, our medical support team. Our civilian uh, support staff, we have two civilian support staff members. Uh, we were, I don't know if you want me to go through the rank structure, but. I do, how many lieutenants were under At you? the time there was three lieutenants. Okay. In, what, in what areas? So one oversaw uh, pre-service, so your academies, and then another one oversaw the use of force program and uh, our range. And then the other one oversaw uh, our leadership professional development programs and uh, assessment center type of things. So they each had an individual kind of specialty things that they oversaw. And who was the lieutenant over the um, defensive tactics training? Who At the time was uh, Lieutenant John Mercil. Sorry. Um, lieutenant Johnny Mercil. What happens during uh, pre-service training now? So pre-service is their police academies. Uh, we have two different types of police academies, a recruit and a cadet program. So they will, um, currently it's changed a little bit since last year, but the time I was a commander, it was 18 and 19 week police academy that they would go through, that they had to pass before they could enter into their field training officer program. So they endure a lot of uh, use of force and defensive tactics. Uh, they train on investigations. They do scenarios, uh, de-escalation, crisis intervention, um, medical, and heavy emphasis on the policy manual and patrol operations. Okay. And <clears throat> the training that's provided, say for example, with defensive tactics, uh, is that different in, in pre-service than the training that's provided during in-service training? It is not different, it's just longer, they get more of it in the academy. If, if you, one moment, Your Honor, if I may. Yeah. Thank you, Your Honor. Right, and, and so fair to say that the, the training that's offered up at the academy, it's just an extended version, a more thorough version of what's offered at in-service. Correct. In-service would focus more on classroom training, and there's a curriculum that's been developed by the defensive tactics instructors and teams, is that right? Yes. They typically show some kind of a PowerPoint presentation going over the rules. Um, and uh, Minneapolis Police Departmental Policy, is that right? Correct. For, for in-service. Whereas the academy, they're gonna go through that same, uh, you know, some of the same concepts and materials, but in a more extended way. Yes. Right? Now, you've also mentioned um, a field training uh, program. In, in order to have the field training program work, you have field training officers, is that right? Correct. And sometimes, uh, I'm sorry, the, the field training officers uh, need to be aware of what the people in pre-service are doing as far as what they're learning in defensive tactics, is that right? Yes. And so is it true that sometimes field training officers 
will receive instruction in defensive tactics, for example, uh, just the same as someone in pre-service training. Correct. And what is the purpose of making sure that the field training officers are uh, aware of what the training is in pre-service? So there's consistency of how we grade and how we evaluate uh, recruit officers on the street. And was the defendant a field training officer? He was. Hey, do you know how long he was a field training officer? I do not know off the top of my head. Hey, did you select him as a field training officer? I did. Now, uh, you've mentioned a variety of different courses that are taken and training that's provided at the Workforce Center. Uh, is it important to keep records of that training? It's very important. And why is that? Uh, because Minnesota Post Board, which is our Peace Officer Standards and Training, require us to complete so much training each year. Um, part of that is the 48 hours of continuing education over the course of three years. And with that training has to be uh, annual use of force, uh, weapons qualifications, mental health crises, procedural justice. So a third of that training, 16 hours roughly out of that 48 hours, has to be um, in compliance with the Minnesota Post Board. And so keeping those records are you know, critical to make sure we can, when we bring them to Post Board, they can do an audit on them. And you rely on those records in order to, in fact, uh, make these reportings to uh, the Post Board so that you have qualified officers on your staff, is that right? Correct. They're kept in the ordinary course of uh, uh, your business, I guess, in the, in the police department? There. This time I'd like to show uh, the witness only, Exhibit 203 for identification. All right, Inspector, can you take a look at Exhibit 203 and I'll ask you to rotate through some of the pages so the witness can examine. You familiar with these records? I am. How are you familiar with them? So these are training records that we track in our workforce director system. Uh, we maintain these records. Uh, each officer has to sign in at training, usually in the morning and the afternoon. And then our civilian coordinator will upload these into the officer's file so we can keep track of the training or if somebody didn't make the training, who needs to make it up. And it's in-service training and any additional training that they had on duty. And I'd like you to go to the back page to show the last page of the witness. Right, and you see that this particular workforce record goes back uh, to 2003. Uh, why is that? And that's when workforce director started, I believe. Okay. Prior to that, there was some different system? Just paper, paper system. Paper system. And how long are those records retained? So in workforce director or in our... How long does MPD retain the training records pre-workforce director? So the city retains records for seven years. So once we have them, We'll keep this in our workforce director. And some training syllabuses and itineraries are put on an M drive. Um, paper copies are generally archived at some point. They're brought down to a central location within the city. But for seven years? Correct. Okay. So these are the records that we have available for this particular individual going back to 2003. Is that yes. Right? Okay. Uh, I'll offer, a, I'm sorry, is exhibit uh, 203 uh, the defendant's training records? Exhibit 203, is this the, def the, yes. the training record of the defendant? Yes, it is. Uh, I'll offer Exhibit 203. Any objection? 203 is received. Uh, permission to publish. And so I'd like to just, if you could uh, scroll up and highlight this first, uh, first record entry here. You can see these records are, are organized uh, in a way that this generally labels the, the course and it gives uh, various dates and then there's a start date and an end date for the participant. Is that right? Correct. And then a total number of continuing education credits that are, that are logged. Is that right? Yes. Okay. I want to back up through these records. If you could bring it out again. If 
you could slide down, please. All right, so uh, just for example, we can take a look at uh, what's labeled here in the 2019 annual training, that section there. All right, and so you see with these records, it's listed as a 2019 annual in-service training, and it refers to a phase three. Right. What is the annual in-service training? So our annual in-service training usually consists of three phases of training. The first phase will have uh, two days of in-service training for officers, so uh, approximately 14 to 16 hours uh, from January to roughly April. And then phase two will roll into uh, our shotgun qualifications or medical training, um, depending on the curriculum that year, what's in that. And that's usually kind of the beginning of the summer months and the end of the summer months. And then phase three is our fall in-service training. And the same thing, it's usually two days of different curriculum that we have to, that we're mandated to do or that maybe the chief wants us to do or that we're trying to do professional development courses. And so regardless of the specific trainer, if, uh, if an individual from MPD is taking phase three 2019 annual in-service training, should they be learning the same thing on that particular day as anyone else in MPD taking phase three training? Yes, they should. If you can zoom out again, go down to 2018 FTO, next page. Oops. Okay, here you see what's marked as a 2018 FTO training program. FTO is field training officer, correct? Yes. And so is this a, a train the trainer program? Yes, from the FTO coordinator and uh, myself as a, the FTO lieutenant at the time put on that training where we brought in a variety of different instructors to teach at that class. And what is taught at, uh, at FTO training? So that was a, a almost 40 hour course and we taught, it was a primary emphasis on leadership, uh, the critical decision making model, um, effective rope, or it's a recruit observation, um, performance evaluation report really. Um, so the FTOs are taught the FTO manual and then they're giving tips on adult, training the adult uh, learner and we do some scenarios in there where they debrief using the critical decision-making model they had defensive tactics they had a component of human resources that came in to explain what the do's and other jobs are as a field training officer it's basically we were trying to make sure that they understood what the recruits are being taught because they're going to evaluate them out there and they're the closest thing to a supervisor that that re young recruit officer has <clears throat> and if uh, I understand your understood your prior testimony uh, defensive tactics and use of force is something that's trained every year uh, during the regular in-service is that right correct so for example in 2018 the defendant would have uh, been instructed in defensive tactics and proper use of force at least twice right once during this 2018 FTO training program and once during the regular in-service. Correct. And uh, if we can, uh, I'd like to at this time, just to the witness, display exhibit 275. At exhibit 275, does that appear to be a, a handwritten records, like a sign-in roster for a particular course? It is. The particular course includes patrol ops, and there's a parenthesis as taught in the academy and defensive tactics as taught in the academy. Is that right? Correct. In the uh, second name uh, on this list, does that appear to be the name of the defendant? It is. Right, and so does exhibit uh, 275 indicate that the defendant um, did receive on uh, November 30, 2018, a block of defensive tactics training as taught in the academy. Yes. 
Offer Exhibit 275. Interesting. No objection. 275 is received. Permission to publish. Yeah. And if you could highlight this portion. And you can see the number of training hours here was eight, is that right? Correct. And so that would have been between divided between patrol ops and defensive tactics as taught in the academy. Yes. And again, the purpose is so that to, a person can be an effective field training officer and know what the trainees or the uh, cadets and recruits are being taught in pre-service. Is that right? Yes. We could go back then to 203. We'll go to the uh, second page, page two of seven, and where it says 2018. Uh, this one, if you could highlight that, please. Oh, it's up for me. Uh, is it just quitter? You want to publish? Oh, I did. I'm sorry. Permission to publish. Highlight that section, please. And, and just to define some terms here, you see uh, it says 2018 shotgun and CIT training. Is that right? Yes. And it's a seven hour block. Yes. Correct. And CIT, what does that stand for? That is uh, crisis intervention training, so de escalation and mental health awareness. You also see there's a training. Uh, indicated for uh, procedural justice and Narcan training in 2018, correct? Yes. And on the uh, uh, crisis intervention training, uh, this one is a fairly short crisis intervention training block, is that right? Correct. They, they switched days. So one group would go to uh, qualify with shotguns and the other group would be in CIT and they'd flip-flop after lunch. But the, but the original crisis intervention training um, block or model that's taught to uh, MPD officers, it's much longer than seven hours or even splitting seven hours, is that right? Yes, it's 40 hours and this is just a refresher. Okay, and so then if you could um, move to the next page, please. And highlight that portion. Uh, the one above it too, where it starts at CIT 2016. All right, and so here you see on the defendant's training records, it indicates uh, multiple eight hour blocks of instruction occurring in November of 2016, is that right? Yes. And is that a show where the defendant uh, attended paid crisis intervention training in 2016, the, the approximate 40 hour course? It does. In addition to, if you can take that down, please. In, in addition to the um, defensive tactics and use of force training, uh, does in-service training require regular medical or kind of combat lifesaver training? Yes, we generally do a medical component. Okay. Can you just please describe what that training entails? Sure. So our medical support team uh, consists of a full-time trainer, and they have part-time trainers that are certified EMTs or paramedics. They're also police officers. So they will perform, uh, they'll conduct CPR training, Narcan, tourniquet, chest seals, um, and just life-saving measures, position, the, the cover positional asphyxia, um, sometimes they cover excited delirium, opioids, um, things that relate to our job when we respond to a call so they can better assess the situation when they get there and be able to render first aid. Now, you mentioned the term positional asphyxia. You're familiar with what that is? Yes. What is your understanding of positional asphyxia? 
So positional asphyxia is if you're in a position where you're, you're not able to adequately breathe. Something is interfering with your airway. And if an individual is in a prone handcuffed position, for example, face down, that could inhibit their ability to breathe. Yes. And cause positional asphyxia. Yes. And what are officers trained to do or supposed to do to prevent positional asphyxia? They're supposed to uh, put them on the side recovery position, which is they're going from prone and just putting them on their side or upright position. How soon are they supposed to do that prior to or after getting the person under control in the prone position? As soon as is possible. How long uh, have you known about the potential dangers of positional asphyxia? Uh, we were taught positional asphyxia all the way back to my academy. At the Minneapolis Police Department? Yes. Uh, have the dangers of positional asphyxia been known throughout the department at least as long as you've been employed there? Correct. And your employment overlaps you know, with the defendants, is that correct? Yes. As part of the medical training, do you, uh, in addition to the uh, actual how-to of, of providing emergency medical care, are uh, officers taught their obligations to provide and render emergency assistance when the circumstances arise? Yes, it's in policy as well as training. You're familiar with the Minneapolis um, critical decision-making model? I am. And that model, you've seen the circle, we've all seen the circle now a few times, that uh, model is uh, infused throughout different portions of the training materials at MPD, is that right? It is. Why is that? <clears throat> we wanted to ensure the officers, a lot of experienced officers understand that critical decision-making model. The more experience you have, the more you can walk through it. Uh, but we found it critical that recruits learn it early on. It was helping them uh, connect the dots better with information they were receiving on the scene and working through that, that wheel, uh, constantly reassessing, and then using the pillars of procedural justice in the middle. And so we wanted it consistent with our field training officer program to debrief them, the recruits, and then and our in-service so that officers out there could constantly reassess situations when they're on a scene. You said that um, the critical decision-making model was used to reassess uh, people who are going through the FTO process? Yes, in the field training officer program, we had scenarios where we had the field training officer debrief. Uh, at the time, we used community service officers as role players, so we had them debrief using that after, after a scenario. So going through the steps of taking in information, assessing risk, assessing threats, reassessing, evaluating goals, um, and then relating that to the pillars of procedural justice, that's something that any field training officer would be required to do with uh, the people that they're evaluating, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. In your defensive uh, tactics uh, training, you are uh, not only showing or having uh, officers learn you know, sort of the nuts and bolts of defensive tactics, but also the rules of engagement. Is that right? Correct. And those are contained in the Minneapolis <coughs> Police Departmental Policies. Is that right? Yes. And the rules are the rules. They apply to everyone. They apply to you. Yes. They apply to uh, recruits. They apply to cadets. They apply to people on field training and experienced officers as well. Is that right? Correct. Uh, I'd like to show you uh, what's been received as Exhibit 17. Uh, I need to ask you, officer, as you look at Exhibit 17, is this a trained technique that's uh, by the Minneapolis Police Department when you were uh, overseeing the training unit? It is not. And why not? Uh, well, use of force according to policy has to be you know, consistent with MPD training. And what we train are neck restraints, the conscious and unconscious neck restraint. So per policy, uh, a neck restraint is compressing one or both sides of the neck using an arm or leg. But what we train is using uh, one arm or two arm to do a, a neck restraint. 
and how does this differ? I don't know what kind of improvised position that is. So that's not what we train. All right. Yeah. You can take that down. Thank you. I have no further questions. Yeah. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. I uh, just want a few follow up questions. In terms of any in service, you see when we look at the exhibit, you see 2020 defensive tactics in service, and it's worth eight hours of time. Agreed? Correct. Now, in that course of that eight hours, officers may go through multiple trainings during that eight hour time, right? Correct, they rotate through things. I'm sorry? They can rotate through different. Right, so one, one uh, in, within that eight hour time frame, they may get a class or an hour long class on say the human factors of force, or they may get a, an hour long course on handcuffing techniques. It varies within each of those eight hour time frames, right? Correct. Now, have you maintained a list that shows uh, 2020, uh, these are the classes that occurred during those eight hours? We have. Okay, and have you provided that list to, uh, in response to the search warrant that was uh, executed at the 
police department? Yes. Okay. Um, now, in terms of um, the defensive t training tactics or any of these continuing education classes, the, there are other officers that actually train these classes, and multiple officers may uh, appear during that eight-hour time, multiple trainers, right? Yes, we have part-time trainers. So there would be maybe one person will teach the, again, the human factors of force, someone else may train uh, on crisis intervention, and there'll be multiple instructors, right? Correct. But a lot of the instructors will use materials from past instructors or they'll take combinations of things and they'll just represent it in a slightly different format, right? At times, yes. Right. And I just, uh, for the record, I want to um, ask you, you were served, or the Minneapolis Police Department was served with a search warrant requesting all of the training materials uh, for the uh, four involved officers in this case, right? Correct. And so this would be materials that were from, some materials that were from the police academy, some materials that were from uh, in-service, just a variety of different uh, records, right? Correct. Um, some 30,000 pages, perhaps? Thousands, yeah. Okay. I have no further questions. Any redirect? No, Your Honor. Right. Thank you, Inspector. You may Thank you. are excused. Members of the jury, we're going to take our break for the day. Uh, we have a hearing we have to do at 8.30, but I'm still hoping that we can get started by 9.15, so same arrangement as today. Thank you. Have a, just a reminder, don't talk to anybody about the case. Don't read in the media. Appreciate your patience. Thank you.